In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's Report today, we continue our series in the book of Daniel. And there's a couple things that you do need to know and kind of set the stage because I encourage you to read the entire fourth chapter of Daniel because it really is interesting and and where he's talking about the different symbolism here in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But suffice it to say, we're just going to give a quick summary here to bring you up to speed and so you can really understand the lesson and the moral of the story and kind of wrap it up in a nice little bow. So Nebuchadnezzar is having this dream that you'll remember we talked about in our last lesson about Daniel. And he needs it interpreted. And he goes to his different magicians, and they can't interpret it. And he goes to Daniel because he knows Daniel will be able to interpret it. And, of course, Daniel does, but he's a little hesitant to do so. Because when he hears the dream, he knows, and you'll remember this was the topic of our last conversation on this matter, he knows that this is unfavorable news. This is news that the king is not going to be happy to hear. He's not going to like it. And in an era where killing the messenger was not a thing that was frowned upon, you can see why Daniel would be a little bit nervous about trying to tell the king that something really bad is going to happen to him. Nonetheless, he has enough respect for the truth and enough respect for God to tell the king anyway. And so this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, it's of a large tree, and the way it describes it is that there are birds and animals living there, that it provides sustenance to others, that it bears fruit. And so this is a great and powerful tree that stretches all the way into the heavens. And then all of a sudden, there is this angelic messenger that comes down from heaven. And this angelic messenger commands that the tree be chopped down. He says, leave the stump and put some iron around the stump, but the tree is going to be chopped down. This great, powerful tree that is majestic and respected, this tree is no longer going to be here because it's going to be hewn down. And the reason that that is significant for Daniel is because he knows the interpretation of this is not going to go well for Nebuchadnezzar. Because the thing is, he realizes Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. So imagine you're put in that situation. Let's say it was your boss, but just imagine your boss also has the power to kill you instead of fire you if they really want to. And you have to tell him that he's going to be knocked off his high horse and it's going to happen pretty soon and nothing's going to be the same afterward. You can imagine how intimidating that would be to have to be the bearer of that message. Yet yet Daniel decides to do this and we'll look at his response and his interpretation of the dream in Daniel 4. 24 through 27, where he says, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place be with the beast of the field, and you will be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whomever he wishes. And in verse 26, And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness, from your iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. The attitude that we see in Daniel and the warning that he gives is not something that should be surprising to anyone. And the reason that I say that is because this is a message that the prophets have been giving for a very long time. You look at any of the major or minor prophets in the Old Testament, you'll notice a recurring theme. God is upset You have been doing something wrong. His judgment is coming. Now, there is a little bit of a difference here because normally 
what happens, and there are, of course, examples to the contrary. But normally when the prophets say this, they're sort of talking about Israel as a whole and how God judges nations and peoples as a whole. This is a very different situation because Daniel is directly addressing King Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying, not your kingdom, you specifically. In fact, the reason that the stump for the tree is left is that his kingdom is going to remain. That The remnants of his kingdom are still going to exist even after he is driven away from mankind in this way, in the way that Daniel is predicting. But nonetheless, Nebuchadnezzar is not going to be there, or at least not in the sense that he is right now. And so when this great thing happens, when God takes Nebuchadnezzar down a peg because he's not doing the things that he should, when that happens, his kingdom is going to be left behind. But Daniel, because I think he does have some genuine concern for Nebuchadnezzar, and because he knows and has been with God long enough to know that God does want people to repent and do good. He's not just somebody that takes great pleasure in punishing people. When God punishes somebody, it's because he's run out of options. When God punishes somebody, it's because they can no longer operate without some kind of justice taking place. Because God often is incredibly patient, long-suffering, and gives us plenty of time to repent. This is a characteristic of God that goes Old New Testament. It's something that is so ingrained into his, his demeanor, his character. All of it is a part of God that he is merciful and long-suffering for as long as he can be up until it is no longer profitable. And I think that that reveals a very real truth about Nebuchadnezzar and worldly powers and maybe even individuals in particular. That sometimes God gives even people that are doing the wrong thing power to serve his purposes. This is something that, again, is true throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. The Assyrians got away with a lot, but they didn't get away with a lot because they were doing what God wanted them to. They got away with a lot because they were punishing other wicked nations, that God was using them as an instrument to go and punish them and hopefully turn them back to God and back to doing the right thing. And so even though the Assyrians themselves weren't doing the right thing, he used them as a way to get in touch with and to wake up the people of Israel and with surrounding nations. He did the same thing with Babylon. He did the same thing with Egypt. This is a theme that recurs over and over again in the Old Testament, that God uses even the worst people, even very wicked and evil people, to accomplish his purpose, to let people know that you need to repent and you need to turn away from your sin or else you're going to fall victim to it yet again. And it seems that God is dealing with Nebuchadnezzar in the same way and thank God that he deals with us that way as well. That he leaves time for repentance. That even when we're allowed to go unpunished for a time, the reason for that is not that God doesn't care. And the reason for that is not that God is uninterested in our lives or doesn't care if we sin. He may care if other people sins, but he's not all that interested in us. No, every soul is important to God, including Daniel, including Nebuchadnezzar. And because of that, and because Nebuchadnezzar is not living the way that he's supposed to, God is sending this message to him through a dream and even gives him Daniel to interpret that dream. So he's giving him the line of communication and the way to read that line of communication. And he's doing so specifically because he knows that Daniel is going to deliver this message. The message of, if you want to avoid this terrible fate that is going to happen, you need to repent. You need to turn away from your evil ways. You need to start obeying God the way that you were always intended to. And then maybe God's hand will be stayed. That's the message that Daniel is trying to give Nebuchadnezzar. So if you're asking whether or not this is fair... I think it's incredibly fair that God does give Nebuchadnezzar a chance to avoid this punishment if he'll just do the right thing right now. And isn't that the message of salvation that Christ gave? Yes, you've done terrible things in your past. Yes, you have horrible things that have gone on in your life that you have lived in rebellion against God. But there is time to repent. If we are still here on earth, if we still draw breath, there is still time to repent and turn from our wicked ways, and be forgiven of our sins. That message was true for Nebuchadnezzar. 
It's true for us today. Stay the course, friends. Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. But the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. So, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.